Okay, the reading for this week is uh, uh, Kagero Nikki, uh, which was, uh, is a diary from the Heian period, and it's by the author Michizuna no Haha. She's often referred to as or the mother of Michizuna, and she lived from 935. Can you shut the thing uh, Michizuna, mother of Michizuna, she lived from 935 to 995, and this diary is said to have begun uh, around 971. And obviously we're not going to read the entire diary because it's very long. And a recent translation came out a few years ago, maybe a decade or so ago, by uh, Sonia Arnsen. And I will put the link to the uh, recent translation in the description below so you can purchase it and read the, uh, the Nikki, the diary, in its entirety on your own. But for this class, as always, we'll be using this PDF file that I uh, distribute to you all. And it has uh, Sonia Arnsen's uh, recent translation excerpts from the work, as well as the original classical Japanese on the right side. So we will go over both in class. And for this video, I'm, I'm going to have my uh, assistant, Nicole Ellison, read excerpts from books one, two, and three. So there's three books in total, and we'll be reading excerpts from all of the three books. And before I turn it over to her, I'm going to read the uh, summary of each of the three books so you have an idea of what's going on in each of them. Uh, starting with book one, uh, the book one covers 14 years in the author's married life from the year 954 to the year 968. So again, she began writing the diary around 971, so she's uh, recollecting these prior experiences in her life from the past uh, 14 years. The author, Michizuna's mother, is a woman from the middle-ranking aristocracy. She's about 19 years old when the proposal for marriage comes from Fujiwara Kaneie, one of her kinsmen from a distant and more powerful branch of the family. It is assumed that the author, as I just mentioned, began writing the diary around 971, many years after the events recorded in Book 1. The first indication that the diary was actually begun later is in the introductory paragraph, where she states that the events of the years past are vague in her memory. She starts the diary in the third person, giving it the feel of a monogatari, or a fictional piece of writing. However, within one long sentence, she moves to declare her purpose to write a sort of anti-monogatari, or anti-romance, namely the record of a person's uh, life, her own life. The reader will see her struggle through book one as she alter alternately recaptures the moments in her marriage that accorded with the romantic or monogate ideal and laments the points at which the relationship fell short. Running through the narration is her record of correspondence and the exchange of poetry. So there are many uh, waka poems that are of the uh, syllabic pattern 57577 as we saw in the uh, previous readings. Uh, so there's lots of uh, poetry exchanges in the work, and poetry exchanges, of course, were an in integral part of communication in the period. In fact, in many respects, books, book one is more like an anthology of poetry than a diary, at least in the conventional Western terms. Her style of narration is elliptical and fragmentary. She is not interested in filling out the picture so that we get a s clear sense of who all the characters are, all the actors are, and what the chronology is, it's more impressionistic. Her focus is rather on the heightened moments of sensibility, which usually involve the composition of poetry. Okay, book two, brief summary here. Book two covers only three years, from 969 to 971. After a rather hopeful start, the tone of the narration becomes more and more distraught as the author's dissatisfaction with her marriage increases. Kaneie takes up with another woman again, and while this is a catalyst for the author's anguish, she struggles more with her own state of mind than with him. She takes two pilgrimages that help briefly by removing her from the immediate situation, but her mind has begun to run in obsessive patterns from which there seems to be no relief. She finally withdraws to a mountain temple against her husband's express wishes to consider becoming a nun. During a retreat, however, through conversations and exchanging poems with people other than her husband, she achieves some kind of distance from her situation. Even though her period of resistance ends in what might be termed a rout by her husband and son, she comes down to the mountain of a, she comes down the mountain a different person. Most scholars of the text agree that she probably started the diary project sometime during the three years covered by book two. Many suggest 971, as I mentioned earlier. 
the year of the crisis in her marriage. The evidence for that is the degree of the narrator's closeness to the events she relates. There is not the pulling back and con contemplating events from the perspective of hindsight that we see in book one. Nonetheless, a dual perspective of a different sort emerges in this book, in book two. In the midst of her experiences, the author begins to achieve some ob objectivity about her situation. While in the first part of book two, the author is often crying out her pain within a mental prison, by the end she is able to step outside the bars of the cage and observe herself as she suffers. There is a higher proportion of prose than poetry in book two. So in book one we saw a lot of poetry, there's more prose here in book two. Uh, then poetry gaining mastery of prose language itself may have been a way for in with, uh, for her to re-establish re some sense of control over her life. Okay, that's the summary of book two, given provided in uh, the PDF file that you have. And here, uh, very briefly, is the summary of book three, and then we will turn it over to Nicole, and she will read uh, excerpts from book books one, two, and three. Book three, which covers three years. 972 to 974, is most like a conventional diary in that it has frequent entries that appear to have been written soon after the events. Moreover, the events are more miscellaneous, rather than being focused on the author's struggle with her feelings about her relationship. Indeed, in general, the emotional intensity of the first two books is absent. A more objective point of view prevails. As she brings into her narrative the stories of other people, notably the story of her, the mother of her adopted daughter, her son's courting of two women, and the pursuit of her adopted daughter by a rather determined old man. Yet in this book, too, a dual point of view is discernible. This is still her personal record, but as she tells the stories of herself and others objectively, the narration takes on some of the qualities of a fictional account. So you remember, as I mentioned at the beginning, she begins in the kind of monogatari mode, in the third-person mode. Then she switches to more uh, personal, first-person diary format. And then at the end, in uh, book three, she returns to the monogatari format. So this kind of book uh, wave, wavers between those two poles throughout. In the choice of details for description, and even the choice of the events themselves, there is evidence of the desire to make a good story. Accordingly, her mastery of prose narrative increases. It is as though we see the diarist turning into a novelist. Right? It's obviously a, an anachronistic uh, use of the word novel there, but um, uh, it's monogate rather than shosetsu that exists in the Heian period. But we'll discuss that in class. Okay, now I shall now turn uh, over the microphone over to Nicole. Okay, uh, Nicole, you're also going to see also. Hi. Thank you. Okay. So, book one. Thus time, the time has passed, and there is one in the world who has lived to see such a vain existence, catching on to neither this nor that. As for her appearance, she can hardly be compared to others, and her intelligence, to say she has some, is as good saying as she has none at all, so it is only natural that she has come to such a useless state as she thinks again and again. It is just that, in the course of living, lying down, getting up, dawn to dust, when she looks at the odds and ends of the old tales, of which there are so many, there are just so much fantasy, that she thinks perhaps if she were to make a record of a life like her own, being really nobody, it might actually be a novel, be novel, and could even serve to answer, should anyone ask, what it is like, the life of a woman married to a highly placed man, yet the events of the months and years gone by are vague. Places where I have just left it at are indeed many. Well then, for this ultimately disappointing affair, there was, of course, the exchange of love letters. From about the time that he has become a tall tree among oak trees, it seems that he has made his intentions known. An ordinary person would have sent a discreet letter using a service maid, or someone like that as a go-between to make his feelings known, but this man goes right to my father, half-joking, half-serious, hinting at the idea, even though I told my father that it did not suit me at all, just as, just as if he did not know. One day he sends a retainer riding on a horse to pound on our gate. Who was bringing whose messages? We had not a hint, so there is not, so there is a big commotion. We were quite perplexed, and accepting the message brings on another commotion. When I look at it, the paper and so on are not what you would expect in a letter. I had heard from, uh, heard from, I had heard from of old that in such a case the, le the hand would be perfect. But the writing in this is so bad that I feel it couldn't be that sort of letter. It is so very strange. The words were, Otoni no mi, kigeba kanashina, 
ほとと犠牲こと語われるもと思う心あり。Only to listen to your sound alone is sad, cuckoo bird. That would, would, would that I could speak with you. This is what my heart longs for. And that was all. When we all discuss it, how about it? Does it require a reply? My old mother says, it does. So, I feel, so feeling obliged, I have someone right. Katara wa mu, hito na kisato ni, hoto to kisu, kae na kere urubiki, koe we na fushi, furushi so. Toward this village, where there's no one to speak with, cuckoo bird, do not flutter a voice that will be quite to no avail. With that as a beginning, there were missing ones after another, but I, as I did not reply, there came this. おぼつかな、おとなきたきの、みずなれや、ゆくえもうしらぬ、せいをぞたずむる。So faint I strain to hear the soundless waterfall, you are its water, though I know not where it goes, yet I seek the ford to meet. When I send back, I will answer soon, he sends us so quickly that I wonder if he was in his right mind. ひとしれず、いまやいまやと、まつほどに、No one can know. Maybe now, maybe now. The longer I wait without hearing back from you, the more wretched I become. With this, when this arrived, my mother said, How awful! Hadn't you better be a bit more mature about this and send him a reply? So I had a suitable person write a suitable reply. Even with that, he was genuinely happy and corresponded abundantly. Another time, this was, the, this was attached to a letter. はまちどり、あともなぎさに、ふみみぬは、われをこすなみ、うちやけつらま。Of the shore, pav- of the shore plovers, no tracks at sea's edge I see, no letters in the sand. It is that a strong wave has washed over me and struck them out. That time too, using a person who could write a properly serious response, I deceived him. There was another letter. While I'm glad to have your seemingly serious response, if this time again there is nothing from you yourself, how painful it would be, and so on. Written on the margin of this grave epistle. いずるとも、わくぬ心は、そえたれど、こたびは先に、みぬひとのがり。No matter whose hand, your unnoticed heart must be present therein, but this time for the first time, I wish for the unseen one. Even though he said this, I continued, I continued to deceive him as before. With our corresponding in this serious fashion, the days and months passed. After months of exchanging poems, Kanie visits the woman for three consecutive days, signifying the beginning of their marriage. He continues to see her frequently, and she gives birth to Nijitsuna. Around the time of the new year, when I had not seen him for two or three days, I was to be away for a while, so I left, with this, so I left this with the instructions. Should that person come, give him this. Shiraneba, Mio Ubisu no, Furi itetsu, Nakite koso yuke, no, Nimo yama nimo. My feelings of sadness, unknown, like the warbler trilling forth with all its might, I have gone forth crying to the fields, to the mountains. His reply Uguisu no, Adani yukamu, Yamabe nimo. The warbler seems capriciously to have gone forth into the hills, but if I hear but its crying voice, I shall seek it no matter how far. As we carried on saying such things, something that had never, pum- never been before came to be. I passed a miserable spring and summer, and then, around the end of the eighth month, somehow gave birth to a child. His care for me at that time was most tender. Then, around the ninth month, Just when he had left for one day, for no particular reason, I opened a box that, box that happened to be there and saw the letter obviously intended for another woman. Greatly astonished and thinking I would at least let him know that I had seen it, I wrote on the letter. Utagawashi, hoka ni wataseru, fumi mireba, koko ya todae ni naramu to sura. How suspicious. I see this letter's tracks leads to another do- another's door. As for here, am I to think your visits will be no more? As I worried, things went much as I feared, and around the time of the tenth month, there comes a time where I do not see him for three nights in a row. With an air of unconcern, he excuses himself by saying, I just wanted to test your feelings by staying away for a while. 
When evening fell, he says, there is some business at courts that I can't get out of, and leaves. I do not believe him, and have a man follow him, who came back saying, it seems that his lordship went to a certain place on Machi Alley and stayed there. So that is how it was. Although I was utterly miserable, I didn't know what to say. It was about two or de three days afterwards, just before dawn, that there was a knocking on my gate. Thinking that it must be him, I felt wretched, and as I did not have the gate opened, he went off to another place. The next morning, I felt I couldn't just leave things as they were, so I composed. Nagekitsutsu, hitori nuru yo no, akurama wa, ika ni, hisashiki, mono to ka washiru. Sorrow, sorrowing. When one sleeps alone the time, until night opens, into the day, how long it is, perhaps you know it, too. I wrote this with more than usual care and sent it attached to a faded chrysanthemum. His response, I was going to wait until dawn to see what would happen, but just then a message from the court came and called me away. It was just as you say. Geni ya geni, fuyu no no yo naranu, maki no tomo, osoku akuru wa wabishiki keri. Truly, truly so, even though the fine wood gate is not a winter's night, to be late, so late to open, how miserable it is. Well, it got very strange. He carried on quite openly as though there was nothing amiss when one might have expected him to try and hide the affair a little and make excuses about having to work at court and such. He became more and more inconsiderate. There was no end to it. Kanie continues to openly visit the woman of Machi Alley. Michitsuna's mother inquires as to whether Tokihime has been receiving visits and discovers that she is being ignored as well. As her relationships to Kaniye becomes increasingly strange, Michitsuna's mother sends him poetry chiding him for his lack of attention. At the place that was in such ascendancy these days, it became time for the birth of a child, and choosing an auspicious direction in which to remove her from the lying in, he rode out in a single carriage with her, raising a con continuous din that could be heard over the entire capital. It was such a racket, so painful to my ears, and did he really have to pass right by my gate? I scarcely felt like myself at all, unable to say anything, and hearing noisy complaints from the lowliest servants to my closest attendants, who were saying things like, It's such a thing, it tears one apart, and there are so many other streets he could have taken. I thought that all I wanted to do was die, yet things do not go as we want. From now on I thought wretchedly, if the best is not to be, then it would be better to break off relations entirely, so that I wouldn't have to see him. About three or four days after this, there's a letter from him. Thinking over and over to myself as I read it awfully cold, how awfully cold it was, I noticed this. Someone has not been feeling well here, so I have not been able to come and visit. However, just yesterday, a safe delivery was accomplished. I haven't wanted to trouble you with the ritual pollution. This surpassed all for being bizarre. I merely sent back, message received. When I heard that in response to my servant's inquiries, the messenger has responded, the household was blessed with a boy. I felt as though my chest were blocked. About three or four days later, he showed up himself as though nothing were the matter. With a look on my face of, what are you doing here, I did not welcome him in, and finding things very uncomfortable, he left. This happened often. The seventh month arrived, and around the time of the annual sumo tournament, two bundles of cloth, one of used and one of new cloth, are delivered. Please sew these, is the message. I am appalled. What on earth does he mean by this? Just looking at them, I feel my eyes darken with anger. My mother says, how regrettable. There must be no one over there who can do these. Some of the more outspoken attendants gathered around and said, this really is the limit. Suppose we don't do it and just see what sort of bad things they'll say about us. And so it was decided. We sent the bundles back and, as we suspected, we heard he had divided them up here and there to get them done. He must have found it very cruel. For more than 20 days, there were no inquiries from him. Then, on what occasion, I can't quite recall... There was a letter from him. It said, I would very much like to come and see you, but it seems you are feeling very, feeling very cold towards me. Certainly, if you were to say, come, in fear and trembling, I would be at your door. I thought not to send a response to this, but as on all sides there were cries of, that would be too cruel of you, it would really be too much, I sent back. Honi idete, iwaji yasara ni, oyoso no, nabiku oba ni, makasete momimo. Not putting forth plumes of words, rather I will change the pampa's grass to sway whither it will. In general, I will watch. He sent back. Honi ikeba, mazu nabiki mamu, hana suzuki, kochite fukaze no, fukamu mani mani. 
When the plume comes forth, whither first it will sway, flowering pampas grass, with the east wind which says, come hither, and so it does. As there was a messenger to take back a response, I wrote, Arashi no mi, fukumeru yado ni, hanasu suki, honi ite idetai to, kahi ya nakaramu. At a house that is only buffeted by storms, flowering pampas grass, even if it puts forth flumes of words, what good does it do? And so on. We had a good exchange and he came to visit again. While still lying down and gazing at the flowers of the front garden blooming in rank, multicolored profusion, we said the following. It seems we both had feelings of resentment towards each other. When he breaks the silence with this, Momokusa ni midarete miuru hanu no iro wa tadashira tsuiru no oku ni oku ni ya aruramu the wild-looking hue of these myriad flowers. Is it due only to the white dew fallen there, or have their hearts turned cold? I reply, Mi no aki o omoi midaruru hana no ue no tsuyu no kokoro wa ieba saranari. Thinking of autumn, these rank glowing wild flowers, were they to speak, of the heart of the dew upon them, it would be thus. Saying such things, it was painful between us, always. As the late rising moon was just about to emerge from behind the mountain ridge, he makes as though to depart. Then, perhaps seeing the expression on my face as I think, surely, tonight, at least he doesn't have to go, he says, well, if you really think I ought to stay? But I didn't feel that desperate, so I say, Ikugasemu, yama no ha ni dami, todomara de, kokoro mo sora ni, ide mo tsuki iwaba. What is there to do? Since your heart is like the moon that does not linger at the edge of the mountain, but would emerge into the sky. He replies, Hisakata no, sora ni kokoro no, izu to iheba, kageha soko ni mo, tomaru biki kana. You say this heart moon emerges into the overspread sky, yet will it leave its reflection behind in this pond? And so he stayed. Kanye visit, visits Michizuna's mother only sporadically, and she criticizes him when they exchange poetry. Sometimes this has the, exire, the desired effect, but other times he continues to stay away. Things going along in this fashion, it seemed that after the birth of her child, that splendid personage of Machi Ali lost favor. In the midst of my feelings of hatred, I had wished to see her live long enough to suffer just as I had. Now not only had it come to pass, but to top it all off, was not the child that had been the occasion of all that annoying clatter dead? The lady was the wild oats of an unrecognized son of a prince. Needless to say, she was extremely base. Just for a time, she had been able to cause a stir among unknowing people. Now suddenly it had come to this. How must she be feeling? When I thought she must be even a little more miserable than I had been at that moment, I felt as though I could breathe again. Now I hear, I hear they have swept the pillow for him at his foreign place former place. However, as for here, since he visits irregularly as before, there are times when I think there is no affection left between us. My little one here has just begun to say a few words. Whenever his father takes leave of us, he always says, see you soon, and the little one hearing this goes around imitating him. Michitsuna's mother composes an extended appeal to her husband in a long poem of more than 100 verses. He responds in the same form, and the exchange has the effect of bringing them closer. The year has changed over. There was nothing particularly different. The times when his heart was unusually affectionate were times where all seemed peaceful. From the first of the month, he was once again admittedly to serve in the inner chambers of the court. It was the day of the Kamo purification rites in the fourth month, when the prince from before graces us with, it, with this letter. If you were going to view the event, I would like you to ride in our, I would like to ride in your carriage. In the margin, he had also written a little poem that began, This year, for me, missing text. The prince had not lately been at his villa next door. We thought he was off visiting a place near Machi no Koji, and inquiring about this, we were told, Yeah, he's there. <laughs> Requesting an inkstone, he wrote this. Kimi ga kana, machi no minami ni, tomi ni osaki, haru ni wa imazo, tazune, maireru. Just as a late spring quickly visits you in the south of this city, I have come as fast as I could to attend you, and here I am. 
Thus it came about that we went out together. That season passed. At another time, when the prince was in residence next door, we passed by his garden. Last year we had noticed some luxuriantly growing pompous grass that had lovely flowers and looked very graceful. My husband had requested, if you were going to divide the roots sometime, please be so kind as to give me a little. Now time had passed and we were with a companion going along the bank of Kamo River. We just pointed out to our guest, that's the prince's place, and my husband sent a servant in it to pay his respects. He told him, just give this message to his servants. I should like to visit, but now it is not such a good time as I have someone with me. I thought I might inquire about the pompous grass that I spoke of some time ago. We went on our way. Since we just performed a brief purification rite, we were back before long. One of the servants called out, pompous from the prince, and there it was, carefully dug up and placed in a long box with a slip of green paper attached to it. When we looked at it, this is what was written. Honi ideba, michi yuku hito mo, maneku beki, yadu no suzuki o, horo ga awari nasa. When it flowers, it beckons people off the road. My garden's pompous grass, thus your special wisp for it, and my special digging efforts. It was so charming, but since I have forgotten what sort of poem we sent back, I will have to leave it at this. However, when I think of what I have written up to this point, I really wonder how it was. The relationship continues with its ups and downs for a few years, but Michitsuna's mother never feels completely secure. Around the third month, one day when he had just come here, he took ill, and I was bewildered by this, the, this suffering, as which it seemed nothing could be done. It seemed very serious. He said, Much as I would like to stay here, it is not convenient for the various things to be done. I had better go back to my own residence. Please do not take offense at this. This comes so suddenly, I feel as though I may not have long to live. It can't be helped. Ah, if I die, how very sad it is that I have done nothing that would have you remember me. Seeing him cry, I lose control and begin to cry miserably, too, at which he says, Don't cry. It makes me suffer more. The worst thing all about all this is to have to put from you in such an part from you in such an unexpected way. What will you do? It's not likely you will remain sing single. Yet, if it comes to that, don't marry again until the end of period of mourning for me is over. Even if I don't die, this may be the end of us. Even if I manage to stay alive, I will likely not be strong enough to visit you. And even were there a time when I might be stronger, how on earth would you ever come to me? Oh, if I die thus, this will be the last time we will see each other. And so on. Lying there, he speaks so miserably and weeps. Calling together the various attendants, he says to them, You can see how fond I am of her. To think that if I die this way, I will never see her again makes me feel wretched. When he said this, everyone broke into tears. As for myself... I was even more overwhelmed, unable to say anything. I just wept and wept. At that moment, he began to feel worse. His carriage was brought up for him to depart. He was raised up and brought towards it, leaning on the others. He looked directly at me and kept looking fixedly. How miserable he appeared. And as for me, who was to stay behind, there were no words to express it. My elder brother said, Why are you inviting bad luck in this way? Surely it's not as you think. Quickly let us be on our way, your lordship. And they drove off, my brother holding him in his arms. I cannot begin to say that I thought and felt all that I thought and felt. I sent letters two and more times a day. There might have been someone who took that amiss, but it couldn't be helped. As for reply, he had one of the older female attendants from over there write for him. It is unbearable not to be able to respond to you myself, was all his lordship was able to say. I heard that his condition was even worse than before, and I could see no way of going to see him myself as he had suggested, so as I fretted and wondered on what on earth I should do, ten or more days passed. Then, with all the performing of special services, it seemed that he had become a little better, and begins as one might expect to respond himself. How strange it all has been. I lay ill for so many days with no improvement, never having experienced such distress before. It was a great anxiety, and so on. Taking advantage of when no one was looking, he wrote at length, I am quite conscious now, and while I know there is no way you could come openly to me in the day, come at night. So many days have passed since we have been able to meet. I feared what people might think and felt very uneasy. He replied immediately to my objections by simply repeating the same thing. Thinking there was nothing to do, but no sooner had I said, send for a carriage, than we were drawing up to a side wing some distance from the main part of his residence, where Um had been very nicely prepared, and by the edge of the veranda he was waiting lying down. As the lights are extinguished just when I step down from the carriage, it is very dark and I don't know the way in. How silly, I'm right here, he says, taking me by the hand and leading me in. What took you so long? So saying, he begins to relate in bits and pieces what had happened in the last few days, and after a little while, he says, Bring a light, it's so dark, and to me, 
There really is nothing for you to be anxious about, you know. And so a faint light was placed behind a screen. I have not yet broken my fast and eaten fish, but tonight, once you got here, I thought we could eat some together. Bring in the meal, he ordered, and two trays were brought in. Once we had eaten a little, monks arrived. The night was getting late, and the monks were preparing to chant a service for his health. However, when he said, Please be excused now. Today I have been feeling a little better. A reverend monk responded with, I see it as your lordship says, and withdrew. Just then, as dawn is breaking, I say, Please, call the servants to prepare my departure, but he responds, Wait, it's still so dark, wait a little yet, and so we remain until it is quite light. Then he calls his men servants to raise the wooden shutters, and we gaze out at the garden. See, how do you like the way the flowers and shrubs are planted? He draws me out to look. Look at what time it has gotten to be, how embarrassing, I say, urging him to let me depart. What, you can't leave now? Some rice gruel is on the way. And thus, with one thing after another, broad daylight arrived. Finally, he said, Well now, I shall accompany you back home. I doubt you will ever venture such a thing again, to which I responded. Even just from my coming here, what are people going to think? If it were thought that I had come to drag you off back with me, how awful it would be. If that's the case, there's nothing else to do. I shall have my men draw up a carriage. When the carriage was drawn up with faltering steps, he walked right back up to where I got was to get in. I gazed at him, moved by the sight, and just as I said, What might my lordship be up and around? Tears welled forth. Since it is so distressing to be apart, I would hope to be able to visit as soon as tomorrow or the day after. What a wretching scene it was. When the carriage was drawn a little way off to where the oxen were hitched up, I kept looking at him. I saw that he had returned to the place where we had been together, and was looking in this direction, watching despondently as the carriage was drawn away. I too couldn't help looking back until I couldn't see him any more. Then, while it was still daylight, a letter arrived from him. He wrote many things in this. Kagiri kato. Omoi tsutsukoshi. Hodo yori mo nakanaku naru wa wabishi karikere. Even more than when I came away from you thinking this may be the end, to part with so many things, unfinished, was wretched. My reply. Having seen that you were still far from well, now I am still distracted and anxious. So many things unfinished. Truly it is so. Ware mo sazo. Nodokeki toko no. Ure nara de kaeru namiji wa ayashi karekiri kere. For me too, no peace or ease in birth and birth of one night short's passage. Drenched by waves, the sea road homeward was strange indeed. Then, even though he still seemed to be somewhat ill, with an effort of will he came to visit after two or three days. But gradually, as he returned to his former state of health, he also resumed his former pattern of visiting. The following of her record of her pilgrimaging of her pilgrimage brings book one to a close. Well then, I have had a fervent desire for so many years. I decide that no matter what, I must take a pilgrimage to Hase. I wanted to go in the eighth month, but I cannot always arrange things as I would like. Hence it is the ninth month, and I have made up my mind to go. Even though he says, next month is the purification ceremony in preparation for the enthro en enthronement rites, and my daughter will be going out, out from here to serve as an acting consort. How about waiting until that is over? Then we could go together. As that is not really my affair, I, decide to, I just decide to leave secretly. However, the day I fixed upon is auspicious, so we make a poor, for, pro forma start a day earlier, staying the night around the neighborhood of Hosho, Hosho Temple. Starting from there at dawn, we arrive at Uji Village around noon. Gazing out, I see the surface of the water sparkling in between the trees and find it so moving. Since I want to attract as little attention as possible, I have left with very few attendants, and although this is probably lax of me, I cannot help but help thinking if it were someone other than me what a big fuss and commotion they would be making. The carriage is pulled around and the outer curtains drawn up, just as the people riding in the back are let down. In the direction of the river, when I roll up the blind and look out, I see the fishing wares stretched across. As I have never seen lots of boats playing to and fro like that, it's all so moving and fascinating. When I look behind, there are my servants tired from the journey, eating some rather poor-looking limes and pears with their hands. That, too, seems touching. After eating lunch, the carriage is loaded on a boat, and as we go about smoothly from place to place, they say, Here's Nieno Pond, and here, Izumi River, where there are so many birds flocking together. The scene soaks into my heart. It is moving and enchanting. Having come secretly on my own like this, connecting with everything, I feel tears well up. We cross Izumi River, too. 
We stopped for the night at a place called Hashi Temple. It was evening when I got down from the carriage and rested. The first thing to come out of what must have been the temple kitchen was a dish of sliced radish with lime dressing. Traveling like that, all the things I encountered were so curious and wonderful that I still remember them. The next morning we cross the river and go on our way. I notice some houses surrounded by brushwood, fences, and think to myself, I wonder which one might be the house mentioned in the Kamo tale. How moving it is. That day too we stayed at some kind of temple. The next day at a place called Tsubaichi, a market town. The next morning, when the threads of frost are still white on the ground, there are many people both coming and going, their legs wrapped in cloth leggings, all in various states rising a lively commotion. The shutters are open at the place where we are staying, and while I am waiting to, for wash water to be warmed, I look out and see all these people crossing paths. I think to myself that they must all have their own concerns and worries that would bring them on a pilgrimage like this. A little while later, a fellow arrives holding a letter aloft. He stands there and says something like, a letter from his lordship. I look at it, it said. I've been worrying, worrying yesterday and today. Why did you run off like that? You went with so few attendants. Are you all right? I seem to remember you said you would go on a retreat for three days. Let me know what day you are coming back. At least I could come and meet you. In a reply, I wrote, It seems that we have arrived smoothly to this place, Tsubaichi. However, taking this opportunity, I am thinking of going from here even deeper into the mountains, so I cannot tell you the exact date of our return. Meanwhile, my attendants, discussing among themselves, say such things as, Being on retreat for even three days is bad enough. Having heard all this, me the messenger returned. We left from there, and as, long as, and as we go along, even though the path is nothing to speak of, it still gives me the feeling of being deep in the mountains, and the sound of the water is very affecting. Those famed cedars are living, even now piercing the sky. All kinds of colors of tree leaves can be seen. For among many stones, the water gurgles forth. Seeing the scene struck by the light of the setting sun, tears pour forth endlessly. The path to here had not been so especially charming. There were as yet no red autumn leaves. The flowers were all gone. One could only see withered pompous grass. Yet here the feeling is special. When I look out, rolling up the outer blind, pushing aside the inner blind, the color of this well-worn robe is quite different. When I pull the train of lavender gauze around me, the ties cross over my lap. How well their color complements the burnt under of this robe. How enchanting I find it all. The beggars with their pots and bowls set on the ground before them, how sad they seem. Feeling so close to the poor and lowly, entering the temple precincts is left uplifting than I expected. In the temple hall, unable to sleep, having nothing else to do, I listen intently to the noises outside and hear a blind person, who does not at all seem all that poorly off, pouring forth in a loud voice, all his troubles without any thought that others might hear. Moved by this, my tears just pour down. On the way back to the capital, Kanye comes to visit her party at Uji and spends a day with her there. Thus, her pilgrimage ends with a feeling of celebration that, it would appear, puts the diarist in a better frame of mind to participate in the preparation for presenting Kanye's daughter at the purification ceremony. The day after we returned was very close to the purification ceremony. Now, I would like you to do such and such, came his requests. Yes, and how should it be done, I said, getting caught up in the bustle. The day of the event, the ceremonial carriages followed one upon another. The woman and male attendants followed along too. Everything was so bright and colorful, I almost felt as though I was a part of the parade myself, also very stylish. The next month came the enthronement rites, and the expansion of everything to make sure it was perfect was most time-consuming. I too was busy with preparing to attend the ceremony, and then it was the end of the month, which was at the end of the year, so we all got very busy all over again. Thus the years and months have piled up. As I lament that this has not been the life I wanted, even voices of well-wishers well mingled with the birds singing anew bring no happiness. All the more I sense how fleeting everything is. This feeling arises. Am I? Is the world here or not? This could be called the diary of a mayfly or the shimmering heat on a summer's day. Book two. Thus, while days passed empty and fleeting, the year came to an end and New Year's morning has come. Oddly enough, for years our household has not observed the custom of avoiding inauspicious speaking at the beginning of the year. So wondering to myself if that was why things had turned out as they had, getting up and crawling out of bed, I say, Hey everyone, come here. For this year at least, let's avoid speaking inauspiciously, 
and we'll see if it has any effect in the world. Hearing this, my sister, still in bed, says, I've got something to say, and chanted the old poem, So heaven and earth into a bag, and so it gets more and more amusing. Well, as for me, I say, thirty days and thirty nights of every month, let him be by my side. At this, one of my atten attendants breaks out laughing. Surely you'll get your wish. Why don't you write that down exactly as you just said it, and send it to his lordship? In response to this, my sister gets up and says, What a good idea! It would bring the best luck in the world. And she laughs and laughs. So I write it down and had my young one present it. These days, he is such a figure in the world that this house was teeming with New Year's well-wishers. Apparently, he was just about to leave for court when my message arrived. And although he was in a rush to get away, there was this response. I suppose he is referring to the fact that there will be two fifth months this year. Since every year, your love overflows the bounds. Is it for your sake, this year, that they had to put in an extra month? Well, I think we've really done it with this New Year's well-wishing. Around the 25th or 26th of the month, the minister of the left residing in the West Palace is banished. The whole capital is in an uproar. Trying to see how things are, people rush to the West Palace. When the minister himself understands how serious the situation is, he does not show himself to anyone and steals away. In the uproar, some say he is in Atago, some say Kiyomizu, he is finally found out, and when he hears that he is indeed to be banished, his terrible grief is beyond expression. There is no one among those who know and are concerned with the affair, not to mention even someone like myself not connected with it at all, who does not dampen their sleeves for him. His various sons, too, are separated and scattered, whether they know not, to live under the sky of a strange country, some taking the tonsure, all meaning with unspeakable misery. The minister, too, becomes a monk, but nevertheless he is forced to accept the duties of a post in Kyushu and exiled there. For that period of time, this affair was all one heard about. In the diary only for things related to me personally, this is perhaps something that shouldn't have been included. However, since the deep feeling of sadness about it were my own and not anyone else's, I have recorded it. While I was thinking such thoughts as these, the last day of the year and the middle of spring arrived. As for him, it is rumored how he is in a rush to move tomorrow. No, tonight, into that splendid residence on which he has lavished such care. As for me, just as I thought, I am to remain where I am, and I suppose that's best. Such being the case, I have consoling myself with thoughts of, you learn from bitter experience, and so on, when I get caught up in preparations for the archery contest to be held around the tenth of the third month at the palace. My young one has chosen to participate as a member of the after team. Since it has been declared that the winning team will present a dance, these days everything else is forgotten in the rush to attend this. Every day the house resounds with the sound of music for the dance practice. Going off for archery practice, he comes back with prizes won from her skill. Looking on, I feel terribly pleased. The tenth day arrived. Today they hold a sort of dress rehearsal here. The dance master, Ono Yoshimochi, receives a lot of presents from the lady attendants. All the other participants to a man take off robes for him. Announcing, his lordship is observing abstinence. Nonetheless, all his retainers come. In the evening, just as the rehearsal is coming to an end, Yoshimochi comes out and dances the butterfly piece. Afterwards, someone removes his saffron signet, singlet and bestows it on him. How well this fit the occasion. Then again, on the twelfth day, they say, We have to gather the whole of the after team together for dance and archery practice, but it is inconvenient to hold it here because there is no archery practice ground. So it is held with great to-do over at his residence. I hear that practically all the high-ranking courtiers are attending. It seems the dance master, Yoshimochi, will be buried in congratulatory robes. For my part, I wonder and worry, how is it going? How is it going? The night grows late, and my son returns with a great many people in train. Then, in a little bit, he arrives, and not caring whether people might think it strange, comes right into my room. This one danced so charmingly, it will be the talk of the court. It was so touching, everyone was in tears. I'm still observing abstinence tomorrow and the next day, how very trying. But I will come while it's still early on in the 15th and attend to all the details. Having said these things, he left, but I didn't feel my usual chagrin. I felt so happy. There's no limit to my joy. The day arrives. He comes early. A lot of people gather to attend the dance costumes. There is great excitement, seeing people off, praying for the success of my son's bow. Sometime before, my husband had said, the after team is bound to lose. They picked some rather odd archers. When I heard such things, I wondered if all the effort he had put into the dance would come for naught, and I worried at what was going to happen. The day turned to night. 
Since the moon was very bright, I did not even have the outer shutters lowered. As I fervently prayed, first one, then another, first one, then another attendant runs in to tell the tale of the event. He has taken this many shots. It seems our young lord's opponent is the captain of the right guards. He shot with all his might and defeated his opponent. Moved by each report, yes, yes, such joy and happiness, there is nothing like it. Then another messenger comes with the news. While the after team was expected to lose, with our young lord's arrows hitting the mark, the match ended in a tie. Since it was a tie, the before team led the dancing with a piece entitled King Rhea. The dancer was my nephew, who was about the same age as my son. While they had, when they had all been learning their dances, he had come here to watch and my son had gone there, so they had both taken an interest in each other's dancing. Then my son danced next, and as a result of the general appreciation for his performance, it seems the emperor bestowed a robe on him. Directly, they returned from the palace with the young King Rhea also riding beh on behind. He proceeded to tell me what had gone on, how proud his son had made him, how all the high-ranking courtiers had been so enchanted they had cried, and so on, repeating the story over and over in tears himself as he came as he told it. He called for the archery master and, when he came, loaded him up with all kinds of gifts. Forgetting that I had ever been sad, I experienced a happiness beyond comparison. For about two or three days afterwards, friends and acquaintances, even some priests, came one after another to congratulate us on the young lord's success. Listening to their words, I felt so strangely happy. Kanye fails to visit or write. Machitsuna's mother seeks solace in the poetry she writes for herself and her friends. While I was passing my days in brooding, a letter arrived from him. I have sent letters, but you have not responded. Since you have seemed out of sorts, it seemed best to stay away. However, I am thinking of coming today, was the sort of thing it appeared to be. At this and that attendant urged me to respond. I did, and evening fell by the time I had written it. Before one would have thought my answer could have reached him, he appeared. Since my attendant said such thing as, he may have had his reasons for staying away, please look as though you're not upset. I did my best to change my feelings. It's because I've been in a period of mourning that I've been absent. I had no intention of ceasing my visits entirely. Really, I find your sulking strange. Since he says those things so blithely and unfeelingly, I felt repulsed. The next morning, he says, as there are things I simply must attend to, I'll come soon, either tomorrow or the day after. I do not think it's really true, yet it's natural for me to hope that he might have a change of heart. The thought occurs to me. What if this were to be the last time I will ever see him? Then, little by little, the number of days he does not come increases. So it's coming to pass, I thought, I might become even sadder than ever. Michitsuna's mother considers becoming a nun, but she worries about the repercussions it might have on her son. Although Kanye visits her occasionally, it seems more out of duty than desire. The more I think about this situation, the stranger it seems. I have not heard that he has shifted his affections to a new woman, but suddenly, just as I was thinking about this, I hear from someone who knows of my affairs. There are the serving ladies of his late uncle, the minister of Ono Palace. He has likely become infatuated with one of them. There is one woman, Omi, who has apparently been acting strangely, and it seems she's a rather licentious woman. He wouldn't want her to know that he visits here, so he probably cut off relations here in preparation for winning her. Another person listening to this another person listening to this says, For heaven's sake, he didn't do that. If she really is as easy as a woman as one hears, why should he have to go through all the trouble of scheming like that? So went the conversation. Someone else suggested, If it's not Omi, then it is one of the late emperor's daughters, and so on. It might be this one, it might be that one, it's just so very strange. I'm urged by my attendants. It is though all you can do is stare helplessly at the sun. Why not go off on a pilgrimage, pil pilgrimage somewhere? It's true, these days I can think of nothing else. In the morning I talk about it, at night I grieve about it. Yes, if that is the way it is, even th if this is the season of terrible heat. Isn't it true? I can't just stay as I am. I make up my mind to go to Ishiyama Temple around the 10th of the month. As I intend to go secretly, I don't even let my own sister know, and, gathering my courage, I run out of the house just at the time I thought I might be, it might be growing light. But around the area of the Kamo River, how they found out about it, I don't know. Some people from the household catch up with me. Even though it is quite bright by the light of the remaining moon at dawn, we meet not another soul. On the riverbank, I am told, and can, can see that there are corpses lying around, but I am not even afraid. We have gone as far as Awatayama. I am in such discomfort. We stop to rest for a bit. I don't understand what's happening to me. Tears just pour down. 
When I think someone might be coming, I compose my tearful face as though nothing has happened and we just keep going at, run, at a run. At Yamashita, it becomes completely light. I feel very exposed and hardly know myself. Since my attendants, having placed themselves ahead and behind, are walking along with the hand dog air, the people we meet come toward us are, come toward us are walking along us, think us suspicious, and noisily whisper to one another. How wretched it makes me feel. Finally, as we get as far as running well, what is suggested we have our box lunches. They set up a curtain. We have just started eating when some outriders come up and make an alarming amount of noise. But what are we to do? Who might this be? If any of their attendants were to recognize any of my attendants, how awful it would be. Just as I was thinking that, a large number of mounted guardsmen with a caravan of two or three carriages come up, making a big commotion. Someone says, it's the carriage of the governor of Wakasa. They pass by without stopping, and I feel relieved. How poignant, I think to myself. Just like someone of what status to drive along with great pride and abandon, while, back in the capital, morning to dusk, he has been bowing and scraping. Just so, he would drive along with a great commotion the moment he is out of city limits. It occasions heartrending feelings. Some straggling lower-ranking servants from that procession, such as those assigned to leading the oxen and some others, come close to my curtain and begin noisily wash to noisily wash themselves. I find their behavior so rude, it's outrageous. Finally, when one of my attendants says, Hey, stand back from there, the servants respond with, Don't you know? Everybody coming and going stops here. Who are you to scold us? Watching this exchange, how could I ever describe my feelings? After that procession had passed by, we set off ourselves and passed that checkpoint. I arrived at Uchide Beach in a half-dead state. The people who had gone on ahead had fas fashioned out of some reeds a kind of roof for a boat. Barely conscious, I crawled into the boat, and now we set out rowing to cover a vast distance. As for my state of mind, I felt so awfully sad, so anguished, so wretched. It was unmatched by anything I'd ever experienced before. Michitsuna's mother arrives at the Ishiyama temple and is moved by the natural surroundings. She wishes she could take the tonsha, but feels a strange tie to her son. She returns home to, with, to her servants who have been waiting anxiously. Kanie visits, but their relations are strained. Today, from about noon on, the rain pattered down, sadly falling on and on. So much for thoughts of, I wonder if he'll come. When I think of the old days, it must not have been love, but just his basic lustful nature that brought him to me, not letting wind or rain stop him. Stop him. Now when I think about it, since there was never a time when I really felt secure, my expectations have been exaggerated. <sighs> to think that he wouldn't let wind or rain get in his way, it's no longer something I can expect, and so I spend the day gazing out, sunk in brooding thoughts. With the sound of the rain pattering on, it becomes time to light the lamps. These days, there is a man who visits in the south apartment. When I, f when I hear his footsteps, I think, so, he's come. How touching and charming of him to have come on such a night, and right along that feeling comes boiling up in a swirl of emotion. When I speak out, one of my attendants, who has known me for years, faces me and says, It is sad. In the old days, even wind and rain, that... In the old days, even wind and rain worse than this would not have kept him away. The moment she says this, I feel hot tears rolling down. Omoi seku. Mune no homura wa tsurenakute namido wa wakasu mono ni zarakeri zarikeru. I stifle these thoughts, but the flames in my breast do not appear. They just go ahead and boil up these tears. Repeating this over and over to myself, I stayed up all night in the place away from my bed. The new year arrives, and Kanye fails to make his expected visit. Instead, he passes by her gate twice en route to another location. When he finally does visit, she rejects his advances. Upset and embarrassed by his lack of attention, Mijitsuda's mother decides she will go on a retreat. On the first day of the fourth month, I called my son from the other house. I'm going to start a long fast. I have been told you have to accompany. I, I have been told to have you accompany me. Saying this, I began. From the first, I had, I had not intended to have my devotions be an elaborate thing. I just burned some incense in an earthenware container, placed it on top of an armrest, and, leaning over it, intoned prayers to the Buddha. The sense of my prayers was just this. I have become a person of no happiness. Thinking how miserable it was that over the years my heart has never known any peace, and now it has come to this awful turn in our marriage, please let me quickly perfect my practice and achieve enlightenment. 
Performing my devotions in this manner, the tears trickle down. I remember one time when I heard that time there was hardly a woman without a rosary dangling from her wrist and sutra in her hand. I had said, what a miserable sight they must be. That sort of woman is bound to lose her husband. Now, where had it gone? That desire to crit where had it gone? That desire to criticize. From dawn to dusk, with unsettled heart, not letting up for a minute, even though I had no sense of getting anywhere, I poured myself into the practice. Ah, but the thought came again and again: how strange I must look to people who had heard me condemn other women in the same situation. And when she had such a fragile marriage herself, how could she say such things? There was not a time when that thought came to mind that the tears did not well up. Before the eyes of others, I felt so ashamed to present such a miserable appearance. I passed each day from dawn till dusk completely repressing tears. Machitsuna's mother returns home and continues practicing ascetic activities. Soon she plans another retreat, this time to Hanya Temple in Narutaki. Kanaiya tries to detain her, but she departs along with, Michitsun, with Michitsuna before he is able to act. The mountain path was not anything particular to speak about. I can only think of the times in the past which the two of us traveled this road together. There was that time when I was ill. We were here three around three or four days. Yes, it was around this time of the year. He didn't go, even go to serve at court. Together we were hidden from the world. Thinking about this and other things, I go along the path, tears pouring down. I am accompanied by only three attendants. I get down first at the monastery's living quarters. When I look around, I see some peonies surrounded by a brushwood fence among some other luxuriantly growing plants whose name I know not. They are in such a pitiful state, their pot battles all fallen and scattered. The old, the old poem, Flowers Have Only One Season, comes to mind, and repeating it to myself, I become very sad. Worried that she might choose to become a nun at this time, Kanye follows her to the temple and asks her to return home. Michitsuna is forced to be the unhappy messenger between his parents. Despite pressure from her son and her servants, Michitsuna's mother resists Kanye's entries and remains in retreat. As she continues her religious austerities, she receives visits from relatives and letters of concern. The day after that, someone who would be considered a distant relative came to visit. She brought a lot of prepared food with her. First, she says, Why have you done this? What do you intend to do? If you don't really have a good reason, then this is a disagreeable thing to have done. To which I reply by telling her in bits and pieces just how I had been feeling and what happened to me. She ends up saying that she quite understands and breaks into tears herself. Around twilight, with the evening cicadas chattering away, saying the sad things one would say on such an occasion, she departs just as the Vesper Bells are over. Since she is a person of deep feeling, I imagined how truly sad she must have felt as she left. Then what should arrive from her the next day but a load of things that one needs for a long stay away from home? I was deeply moved and at a loss for words to express it. She wrote many things, and among them, this. I barely noticed anything on the road home. I imagined you as you made your way through the tall trees of the mountain path. How very touching. Yo no naka no. Yo no naka nareba. Natsugusa no. Shigeki yamabe no. Tazune zaramus nashi. If all things were right, with you and yours in the world, I would not have come, visiting you on that mountainside, grown rank with summer grass. Having to leave you behind, thinking of you on the way home, I could barely see for tears and nearly lost my way. My dear one, you seem to distract you seem driven to distraction with the deep sorrow you bear. Yo no nakawa omoi no hokani narutaki no fukaki yomaji o tarashirasekimu. Things in the world have not gone as one would think. And gone you have to. Narutaki, who taught you the road through the deep mountains? She wrote down every little thing just as she were talking to me in person. She mentions Narutaki because that is the name of the river that flows in front of here. In my reply as well, I told her all about that was in my heart. I have been thinking a lot about what you would ask me when you visit here. Why am I doing this? Mono omoi. Fukase, fukasa kurabe ni. Kite mireba. Natsu no shigeri mo. Mono naka naranaku ni. When you came to gouge the depth of my sorrowful thoughts, you surely did see the rank growth of summer's green was nothing in comparison. Well, I still have no idea when I shall return, and while I am troubled when I think about what you said. Mi hitotsu no 
かくなる,たなる滝を尋ねればさらに変え,る変えらぬ水も住みけり All by myself, thus having come to visit this Narutaki, I see the water that will never return and runs clear too. Thus I feel I have a good example to follow. Then again, in reply to a letter from the principal handmaiden, I wrote and wrote about my worries. Having written on the envelope from the Western Mountains, I wondered what she might think about it. On her return letter, she wrote, From the big village to the east. While I found it most delightful of her, I wondered what possessed us to joke thus. Engaged with these things, the days passed and I think sank even deeper into my own thoughts. An ascetic practitioner who was about to make a pilgrimage from Mitake to Kumano, crossing over the mountain's crest trail, dropped this off. Toyamada ni kakari kero to oto. Shirakamu no fukaki kokoro wa shiru mo shiranu mo. Even in these hills, it feels thus, those who know and those who do not know. Feel for your heart deep as the mountains, capped with white clouds where I go. Thinking over such things as this, the time passed when one day around noon, in the direction of the main gate, there was the whinnying of horses and the sound of a lot of people. Looking out between the trees here and there, I saw a number of servants, and they seemed to be coming this way. Just as I was thinking, it looks like the capital of the guards, my young lord was calling out and came back with this message. Apologizing several times over for not having acquired a view before now, the captain has come to pay a visit. Reminded of the capital by watching him take his ease in the shade of the trees, I found it a charming scene. Around this time, my sister had come again, up again, and she sa as she said she would, and it seems the captain has feelings towards her that are not ordinary. He was standing there painfully trying to look his best. I replied, How happy I am to see you. Please come right up. I shall pray for all your sins to be cleansed. When this message was sent, he walked out of the shade, approached the ball balustrade, first washed his hands, and then came in. In the course of talking about many different things, when I asked, Do you remember meeting me so long ago? He said, Why, I remember it very well indeed, even though recently we have not had the occasion to see each other. This brought so many things to mind, my speaking was constrained, and feeling my voice faltering, I stopped a moment to pull myself together. He was very moved as well and immediately stopped speaking. Then he said, Your voice sounded as though you were about to cry, and I understand why, but I didn't want to make you feel even sadder. Certainly you will not end up like this. I thought he must have gotten the wrong impression of me to speak like that. He went on, Father told me, If you are going to go up there, try and get her to listen to you. Whereupon I said, Why does he go on like that? Even without his saying that sort of thing, I am going to return soon anyway. He said, If that's how it is, and if it is all the same to you, why not return today? I would be happy to escort you right away. For right from the start I have felt how awful it has been to see our young lord, when he has made it his, visit, his ever so rare visits into the capital, have to hurry back to this mountain temple as soon as the sun inclined a little. Thus he went on, but as I made no response, he waited a little while, oh, and then departed. Thus I agonized over leaving the mountains. Deep in my heart, I feel that since all the people who might be expected to call have been exhausted, now no one else will visit me. As time passes in this way, there are letters from this and that person in the capital. I read them and they say, Today I hear his lordship is about to come for you. If you don't come down this time, everyone will think you frightful, and it would certainly be unlikely that he would come again. Then, if he were to come back later, how people would laugh. As they were all saying the same thing, it seemed very strange to me. What was I to do? Thinking that this time he will not take no for an answer, my mind was in an uproar when the one I rely on most, my father, having just come back to the capital from a tour of duty, came right away to see me. Telling me what was going on, he said, I thought it should be all right for you to stay here for a while and continue to your devotions, but it's been a most regrettable thing for a young master here. Return as quickly as possible to the capital. If today is as good as day as any, we could go back together. Today or tomorrow, I will escort you. To be spoken to thus in no uncertain terms, my strength left me as I agonized inwardly. He said, Well, then tomorrow it is, and left. Just bobbing like a float on a fisherman's line, my thoughts were all awry. There was a commotion. Someone arrived. It must be him, I thought, and felt suddenly lost and confused. This time, with no reserve at all, he marched directly in. Just as he entered, I drew a rather poor screen in front of me. While it hid a bit of me, it was really quite useless. 
Seeing me there with a pile of incense alight, a rosary hanging from my hands, and a sutra laid out, he said, How frightening. I had no idea it was like this. I feel that I can hardly approach you. I have come thinking that you might be ready to leave here, but now it seems as though you almost it would almost be a sin to move you. How about it, young lord? What do you think about just staying on like this? He replied, looking down. I hate the idea, but what's to be done about it? How sad, he exclaimed. If that is how it is, one way or another, it is for you to decide. If she will leave, then let's have the carriage drawn up. Before he finished saying this, my son leaped up and just began to gather all the things scattered around, wrapping them up, stuffing into bags the things that needed to be packed and stowing it all away in the carriage. When he took the curtains and folded them up other things, roughly packing it all away, I sat there dazed, barely aware of who I was. While all this was happening, he looked on, exchanging glances with my son, seeming very much amused. Well, since things are done, it seems you should come away now. Let the Buddha know your intentions. I believe that is a usual custom. Thus he turned the scene into a noisy farce. I was incapable of saying a word. Though tears welled up, I held myself together. It seemed to take forever to bring the carriage up. Since he had arrived in the late afternoon, it was now almost time to light the lamps. As I sat there impassively, not moving, he finally said to my son, All right, all right, I'm going. I leave it up to you. And when he had gone out, my son, on the verge of tears himself, said, Come on now, and took me by the hand. I left feeling as though it was useless to say anything further. It was as though it was happening to somebody else. As the carriage pulled out through the main gate, he got in. All the way back, he found all sorts of things to laugh at, whereas I sat wondering if this was a dream, unable to say anything at all. My sister, who had been with me, was riding in the same carriage with us. Since it was dark, she thought it would be all right. She responded to his jokes from time to time. Since it was a long way, it was late at night when we arrived. Back in the capital, since someone had informed the household of his going to fetch me that day, they had gone the good sense to clean the house and open the gate. Still not feeling quite myself, I got down from the carriage. As I was not feeling well, I placed a screen of state between us and lay down in a place apart, at which point one of my household servants pops out and comes next to me. I was going to gather the seeds from the maiden pinks, but they withered up. Even the roots are gone. And that black bamboo, one clump fell over, but I put it to the right, and so on. I feel that this is not really the time for her to be talking about this sort of thing. I make no response, but he, who I had thought must be sleeping, had been listening very carefully to all this, and he calls over to my sister, who was just on the other side of the partition. Would you listen to that? It's quite something. There she is, turning her back on the world, leaving her household behind, seeking enlightenment. But just now when you hear her servant talking to her, you'd think the maiden flowers were her own daughters and the black bamboo's back on its feet. <laughs> my, my, what worldly concerns. Hearing this, my sister bursts out laughing. I too think it is terribly funny, but I do not let even the merest hint of a smile show. After this episode, the relationship continues, but never regains the intimacy of the best of former times. Since there was someone informing me that, that he was going every night to that place that was taboo to me, I hardly passed the time with my heart at ease. Nevertheless, the days and the months passed, and here it was, the last day of the year, the time to chase out devils. I was terribly startled as both of the adults and the children of the household rushed around, shouting, Devils out! Devils out! I just listened and watched quietly. It seemed to me that this was the sort of thing that only households where everything was going well would want to perform. Someone said, It's snowing heavily. As the year ended, it seemed I had no attachments left to anything. Book three. In this way, another new year dawns. It seems it is the third year of Tenroku. Feeling my gloom and pain have quite cleared away, I help dress our young lord and send him on his way to court. As I watch him run down in the garden, into the garden and straight away give a ceremonial bow, he looks so terribly splendid I want to cry. I think, shall I hold a sutra reading service tonight? But then my period is likely to come. That is the sort of thing people usually consider inauspicious, and I wonder in my own heart once more how things will turn out for me. However, this year, having resolved firmly in my own mind that regardless of whether he might be the most annoying person in this world, I not lament, will not lament over things. My heart is very much at peace. Michitsuna's mother maintains her resolution not to pine for Kanye and is able to focus on other concerns. 
Since I had only one son, over the years I had made pilgrimages here and there, making this one fervent prayer. But now I am reaching an age where it will all be very difficult. For the last few months, the thought has occurred to me. How about taking in a girl from a good family? I could care of her. I could take care of her. She could be a good friend for my only son and be there for me in my old age. I have discussed the idea with this and that person. One person said, I have heard that a very beautiful little girl was born to the late Genji counselor, Kanetada's daughter, whom your husband used to visit in a very amorous way. If it's all the same to you, why don't you make inquiries about her? I think the mother is now living at the foot of the mountains in Shiga, relying on her elder brother, who is a monk. Upon hearing that person speak, it came back to me. That's right, there was someone like that. There was someone like that. The family is descended from the late retired Emperor Deze, is it not? When her father, the counselor, had died and she was still in mourning, since he was never one to pass up an opportunity like that, there was this and that exchange between them, and it did end up in an affair. On his part, at first, it was just his usual set of amusement. For her part, since her husband was not a fashionable one and she was not very young, she probably didn't expect it to amount to anything. Nevertheless, I believe that around that time she responded to his letters, he himself went there to see her about two times. Now what was it? There was something about him returning with just a singlet of hers. There were quite a few incidents, but I've forgotten them. Now what was the poem he sent to her? Seki koete, tabine naritsure, kusamakura, karisome ni hata, omohoe ne kana. The barrier crossed, having slept a traveler's sleep on a pillow of grass. Yet I do not think of it as a transient affair. What I believe was what I believe he sent? Since it was such as it was, her reply was not terribly distinguished either. Obotsukana, wara ni mo aru, kusamakura, mada kosu shirane, kakaru tabi ni, tabi ne wa. In bewilderment, feeling it was not me on a pillow of grass, never before had I known such a traveler's sleep, was what she wrote. It's a little strange that she used the phrase traveler sleep too. I remember us laughing about that together. After that, I don't really hear much about her, but I seem to remember she replied like this to some letter. Okisofuru, tsuyu ni yona yona yona. Nerekoshi wa omoi no naka ni kawa kuso de kawa. Dampened through and through, as night after night my tears, even in the flames of longing, fall with dew. How are these sleeves to dry? And so on, like that, they grew further apart and ended in a fleeting affair. But afterward I heard from his lordship. A girl was born at that place I used to visit. She says it is mine. It may well be. Wouldn't it be good to bring the child here and place it with you? It must be the same child. I shall do it. And thus I came to decide. When I made inquiries through an intermediary, I heard that the young person, unknown to her father, was about 12 or 13 years old. Apparently, with only this daughter for a companion, the mother had come to live in the eastern foothills of Shiga. Looking upon the lake in front and the Shiga mountains behind, dawn to dusk, she was living in an inexpressibly forlorn existence. When I heard this, as it is said, pinching myself to know another's pain, my first thought was, there in Naniwa, living that way. She must have feelings left in her heart. She must have words left to say. Now her half-brother is a monk in the capital, and the person who brought up the idea in the first place is his acquaintance. So I had her go to an intermediary to bring him to discuss the idea. He said, What could be the problem? At least in my opinion, it is a wonderful idea. Why, there she is trying to take care of her daughter. But the world has proven such an uncertain place for her. I understand she's even thinking of becoming a nun. And that is why she moved a few months ago to that lonely place. With that, the very next day, he crossed over the mountain and visited them. His sister apparently found it strange behavior on the part of the half-brother, who had never seemed very concerned about her. When she asked, what has brought you here? He chatted with her about one thing and another for a while and then brought up the plan. At first saying neither this nor that, one wonders what she really thought, she just cried and cried pitifully. Then she somehow finally pulled herself together to say, I have felt this was the end for me, and although it has been a very painful to have dragged such a child to such a place as this, what else was I to do? If some way or another, there might be something else for her, I beg you to do as you think best. So he returned the next day and reported what had happened. Amazingly, it had gone as I hoped. Some karmic fate must have been at work. I was very moved. When he said, Well then, would your ladyship please grace her with a letter? 
I replied, of course, and composed this. Since over the years I have heard about you but have never written to you before, I wondered how you could be anything other than bewildered and questioning who I am. Although you must find this very strange indeed, it seems that upon hearing from his reverence the, helpless, the hapless sorrow I relayed to him, you have designed to make a favorable reply. I can only say that I am writing to you now with great joy. My request must seem very callous, but, since I heard that you are thinking of becoming a nun, I thought that you might be willing to give up even such a beloved child. This was dispatched, and there was a reply the next day. With such phrases as, I am happy, she gave her consent with goodwill. In this letter, she also wrote the gist of her conversations with his reverence. Yet, at the same time, imagining her feelings, I felt very sad indeed. She wrote on and on a myriad of things, and then at the end, enveloped in a mist of tears, I cannot tell what my brush writes. It feels strange. I felt that truly it must have been so for her. After that, with the exchange of only about two letters, the matter was decided and his reverence went to bring the girl to the capital. It seemed she was to travel all alone. Thinking of that, I felt sad. It could not have been easy for the mother to let her go like that. She must have been, had she must have in the back of her mind the thought that even that the father might now take care of his daughter. Even though one might hope for that, having her with me did not necessarily mean he would look after her as his own. And if it did not work out, then how very regrettable it would be. Although I felt worried by such thoughts, having made this promise, it was not as though I could change my mind now. As the 19th of this month is an auspicious day, so it has been decided. I sent a party out from, from here to greet her. Not wanting to attract a lot of attention, I just sent a fresh-looking rattan carriage with four mountain attendants and a few extra servants. Our young lord gets in quickly, and I have the person who had first spoken to the girl to, to me right in back. Today, most unusually, there has been news from him. I instruct my son, I fear he's on his way. It would not be good for you to run into each other. Go as quickly as you can. Keep her out of sight. Where am I? Keep her out of sight for a while. We will just have to see how everything goes. This was to no avail, for my husband arrived ahead, and before anything could be done, just a few moments afterwards, the welcoming party pulled in. When he asked, Where has our young lord been? I tried to put him off by saying one thing or another. However, since he seemed to suspect that something like this was going to happen today, I finally told him, Since I am so forlorn, I have taken in a child that someone else seems to have abandoned. Whereupon he said, Well, let's see it. Whose child is it? Since I've gotten old, you probably sought yourself out a young man, and now you're going to dismiss me. This was most amusing, I asked him. Well, shall I show you to her? Show her to you? Would you make her your own child? That would be fine. Please bring her out. Come on, come on. As I was quite curious myself, I called her out. She seemed very small for her age. In fact, she looked much like a child. Calling her closer, he said, Stand up. And when she did, we could see that she stood only about four feet high. It seemed that her hair was a little thin, tampering around the ends and about four inches shorter than her height. She seemed quite charming. Her hairline was lovely and her form elegant. Looking at her, he said, Ah, how charming she is. Whose child is this? Come on, tell me. Thus pressed and thinking, after all, it was not likely to be an embarrassment. I may as well reveal it, I said. Well then, do you really find her charming? Shall I tell you? He pressed me further. What fuss you make? Can't you tell? She's your very own child. He reacted with great surprise. What? How? From where? But since I didn't reply right away, he said, I wonder, could she be the child I was told of at that place? When I replied, it would seem so. He went on, how astonishing. I knew her mother must be living in some miserable state somewhere, but not to have seen the child until she was as old as this. He broke into tears. As for the child herself, whatever she might be thinking, she too was looking down and crying. Those looking on found it so touching, just like something out of an old tale, and everyone cried. I couldn't help crying, bringing my sleeves up to my eyes many times. He said, well, I never, out of the blue like this, just when I was thinking of not coming here anymore, now to have such a person here. I'll just have to take you home with me. So he joked, until quite late at night. We spent our time laughing and crying by turns, and then we all slept. The next morning, when he was about to return, he called her out, looked at her, and seemed to find her so charming. I'll take you with me right now. When the carriage comes up, let's go in together. 
then breaking out until after he left. After that, when he wrote letters, he always asked, How is the little, little one? And the letters came often. Nonetheless, Kanye's visits dwindle, and she no longer expects him to come. Michitsuna's mother is resigned to her tenuous relationship to Kanye, but she worries about her own future and that of her son. I realize how everything has changed. While I have been somewhat out of touch with reality, my dwelling place has fallen more and more into despair. As I don't really have enough people to keep it up, I'm giving it up to, so I'm giving it up to someone else, and my father, whom I depend on, has decided that I should live in one of his houses. So today, the next day, I am going to move to the area around Nakagawa, Hirohata. That such a thing might happen, I have hinted to him before on several occasions, but now, since it is to be today, I thought I had better inform him. Although I sent the message, I have something to tell you, the response was, due to an absence, his lordship is not to be disturbed. As he seemed so little concerned, I thought, why bother, and moved without telling him. The focus of the diary shifts to the affairs of both her son and her adopted daughter. Michitsuna has been invited as invited to act as one of the dancers at the special secondary Kamo festival. Kanye pays a rare visit, pays a rare visit to send his son out to the festival. She herself attends the festival parade. On the day of the festival, no matter what, I had to go and have a look. As I set out, I noticed on the north side of the street an unremarkable palm ca work carriage, parked with its blinds, both in the back and in the front, pulled down. Sleeves of purple brocade layered over lustrous red silk spilled out from underneath the bamboo blind in front. Just as I was looking at this, thinking it must be a woman's carriage, a man of the sixth rank with a sword at his waist approached from the gate of the house behind the carriage, and with great dignity, knelt with one knee on the ground to say something. With some surprise, I looked more closely. I could see that beside the carriage that man had come out of, there were all sorts of men in costumes of red and black standing there all crammed together, so many I couldn't count them all. One of my attendants said, If one looks carefully, there are some men there we have seen before. Things had gone underway a little earlier than usual. The high nobility and their followers as well all seemed to notice him. They stopped and parked their carriages in the same place with the fronts of their carriages facing his. As for the one I care deeply about, he and his attendants too looked magnificent, even though they had little time to prepare. When the high nobility offered him snacks with their own hands and spoke to him, I felt proud. My old-fashioned father, who was not permitted to be in the audience, was mingling among the musicians with blossom-festooned caps. When he was sought out in the crowd and offered a cup of sake brought forth from the other house, just for that moment in time I seemed to feel content. This year the weather has not been particularly bad. We have only had snow that stayed in patches on the ground about two times. While I have been preparing the clothes for the assistant director's attendance at New Year's festivities and then at the presentation of the White Horses, the end of the year has arrived. Having the clothes for tomorrow folded and rolled up, directing the work of the attendants, when I think of it, having lived on thus and arrived at this day, it seems somehow amazing. Even if I watch the festival of the soul's return, the year's edge has arrived with me deep in the unusual endless thoughts. Since we are at the edge of the capital, it is very late at night indeed when the knocking comes to the door. Okay. Nicole, thank you for the wonderful, smooth, lovely reading. Um, I will make a, a study guide about this uh, work, and I will make a, some, another commentary video about the study guide that goes over some of the background information and delves a little more deeply into the text. I'll make that at a further date. And some of you may be wondering about the title, uh, Kagero Niki, what does Kagero mean? It's um, the first English translation that came out uh, in the 60s, I think, by... Um, Edward Seidensicker was gossamer, it, it translated to kagero, the word kagero is gossamer. Uh, some have translated as mayfly too, I think, but um, I think I should give a little explanation about uh, this word kagero. And actually, uh, Nakanishi is so can you hand me that book right there, the white and black one, there's double one right in the middle, left, 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 right there, right there. That one? Yes. Yeah, uh, the great classical scholar of Japanese literature, Nakanishi Susume, Nakanishi Susume wrote a, uh, two books and I translated them into a single English book a few years ago, two or three years ago, called The Japanese Linguistic Landscape. And in that book he goes over this word kagero, uh, which originally was kagiroi, and uh, I translated it in that book as hot waves shimmering in air. So it's something that has a kind of ephemeral uh, image or ephemeral, uh, the, the connotation of ephemerality. So let me read just very briefly uh, the two pages from this book uh, on this section on 
uh, kagiroi, or hot waves shimmering in air. Kagiroi is a noun that describes the soft, shimmering, warm glows of light. It is closely related to kagero, which is often rendered with the Chinese characters uh, for sun, taiyo no yo, and uh, hono, or flame, en. Uh, the term kagero expresses, and keep in mind, there's many different ways to, there's several ways to write this using Chinese characters, but the most common is the yo en way to write it. The term kagero expresses the beams of sunlight that flicker up in waves from the open fields on a spring day. From a semantic standpoint, these two words, kagiroi and kagero, are identical. In fact, any word containing uh, kagi, kage, or even kaga or kagu evokes the same general physical phenomenon. So uh, before kanji had entered the language, uh, kagi, kage, kaga, kagu were all more or less synonyms, right? And kage obviously uh, still exists today as the word for shadow, uh, and also for light. Kage, for example, usually means shadow, but it can also mean the opposite of shadow, namely light. The kage of tsukikage denotes the moon's luminosity, not its shadow. The Shining Princess, or Kagayaku o Hime-sama of the famous 10th century fictional prose narrative Taketori Monogatari, the tale of the bamboo cutter, which we've already read in this class, is Princess Kaguya, Kaguya Hime. The Kagu, in her name, doesn't mean shadow, it means shining, not darkness. As far back as Book One of the Manyoshu, or the 10,000 Leaves, uh, compiled in 759 uh, AD, Japan's oldest poetry anthology. In book one of that anthology, we find a waka by the great poet Kaki no Moto no Hitomado, Mado, uh, who was active in the late 7th century, that includes the term kagiroi. And the poem is as follows uh, Himugashi no Noni Kagiroi no Tatsumiyete, uh, which I translate into English as In the Eastern Fields, the Shimmering Blaze, Kagiroi, can be seen rising. Kakinomoto's poem depicts the first light of dawn emerging over mountain crags as the sun begins to rise. Given that this kagiroi appears over the plain, however, the subtle phenomenon is completely different from the kind of open illumination that takes place at the first light of dawn, uh, namely the akebono. So it's very different than the akebono kagiroi is. Uh, as the sun emerges over the mountain ridge, it not only releases powerful shafts of sunlight that appear to rise into the sky, but also emits countless kagiroi over the great plain that stretches out before the poet's eye, flooding the entire scene in shimmering luminescence. Okay, that might be another good way to translate this kagero uh, of the title, shimmering luminescence. It is in this sense that kagiroi is synonymous with kagero. Kaki Nomoto composed his poem while he was living on the great plain, the sacred setting where Japanese people have, which Japanese people have worshipped the rising sun as a de where Japanese people have worshipped the rising sun as a deity for centuries. At the foot of the hill is a Shinto shrine dedicated to the great deity, or kami, the great spirit, of Ise Shrine, Ise Jinga, uh, namely Amaterasu o Mikami, the greatest uh, kami in Shinto mythology and the divine incarnation of the sun. To Kakinomoto, the great plain that stretched out before his eyes served as a canvas filled with the brilliant radiance of the divine sun deity Am Amaterasu o Mikami shining down from heaven. We often hear how more than half the earth's population currently resides in urban areas for food. Okay, uh, we can skip all that part. It's not really, really relevant that I think it's more interesting. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, my hope is that we forget to discuss the Kagiroi. Even, okay, alright, so that's um, Nakanishi Susume's kind of reflections on this term, uh, Kagiroi, which is uh, related to or even synonymous with Kagero of the title of the work that uh, Nicole just read excerpts from. Alright, that is all for now. I will see you in the commentary video for uh, this work. See you all then. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> <laughs> alright.